Can you explain the responsible scaling policy and the AI safety level standards, ASL yeah. levels? As much as I'm excited about the benefits of these models, and you know, we'll talk about that if we talk about machines of loving grace, um, I'm I'm worried about the risks, and I continue to be worried about the risks. Uh, no one should think that you know, machines of loving grace was me me saying, uh, you know, I'm no longer worried about the risks of these models. I think they're two sides of the same coin. The the uh, power of the models and their ability to solve all these problems in you know, biology, neuroscience, economic development, govern governance and peace, large parts of the economy, those those come with risks as well, right? With great power comes great responsibility, right? That's the the two are the two are paired. Uh, things that are powerful can do good things and they can do bad things. Um, I think of those risks as as being in you know several different different categories. Perhaps the two biggest risks that I think about, and that's not to say that there aren't risks today that are that are important, but when I think of the really the, the you know the things that would happen on the grandest scale, um, one is what I call catastrophic misuse. These are misuse of the models in domains like cyber, bio, radiological, nuclear, right? Things that could, you know, that could harm or even kill thousands, even millions of people if they really, really go wrong. Um, like these are the you know number one priority to prevent. And, and here I would just make a simple observation, which is that mo the models, you know, if, if I look today at people who have done really bad things in the world, um, uh, I think actually humanity has been protected by the fact that the overlap between really smart, well-educated people and people who want to do really horrific things has generally been small. Like, you know, let's say let's say I'm someone who, you know, I, you know, I have a PhD in this field. I have a well-paying job. Um, there's so much to lose. Why do I want to like, you know, even even assuming I'm completely evil, which which most people are not. Um, why why you know why would such a person risk their risk their you know risk their life risk risk their their legacy their reputation to to do something like you know truly truly evil? If we had a lot more people like that, the world would be a much more dangerous place. And so my 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 worry is that by being a a, a much more intelligent agent, AI could break that correlation. And so I, 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 I do have serious worries about that. I believe we can prevent those worries. Uh, but, you know, I, I think as a counterpoint to machines of loving grace, I want to say that this is that I, there's still serious risks. And, and the second range of risks would be the autonomy risks, which is the idea that models might on their own, particularly as we give them more agency than they've had in the past, uh, particularly as we give them supervision over wider tasks like, you know, writing whole code bases or someday even, you know, effectively operating entire entire companies, they're on a long enough leash. Are they are they doing what we really want them to do? It's very difficult to even understand in detail what they're doing, let alone, let alone control it. And like I said, this these early signs that it's it's hard to perfectly draw the boundary between things the model should do and things the model shouldn't do, that it, that, you know, if, if you go to one side, you, you get things that are annoying and useless and you go to the other side, you get other behaviors. If you fix one thing, it creates other problems. We're getting better and better at solving this. I don't think this is an unsolvable problem. I think this is a, you know, this is a science like, like the safety of airplanes or the safety of cars or the safety of drugs. I, you know, I, I don't think there's any big thing we're missing. I just think we need to get better at controlling these models. And so these are, these are the two risks I'm worried about. And our responsible scaling plan, which I'll recognizes a very long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> I love um, it. I love it. Our responsible scaling plan is designed to address these two types of risks. And so every time we develop a new model, we basically test it for its ability to do both of these bad things. So if I were to back up a little bit, um I I think we have a I think we have an interesting dilemma with AI systems where they're not yet powerful enough to present these catastrophes. I don't know that I don't know if they'll ever present prevent these catastrophes. It's possible they won't, but the the case for worry, the case for risk is strong enough that we should we should act now. And and they're they're getting better very, very fast, right? I, you know, I testified in the Senate that, you know, we might have serious bio risks within two to three years. That was about a year ago. Things have proceeded, proceeded apace. Uh uh. So we have this thing where it's like it's 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 surprisingly hard to 
to address these risks because they're not here today. They don't exist. They're like ghosts, but they're coming at us so fast because the models are improving so fast. So how do you deal with something that's not here today, doesn't exist, but is, is coming at us very fast? Uh, so the solution we came up with for that in, in collaboration with uh, you know, people like uh, the organization Meter and Paul Cristiano is, okay, what, 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 what you need for that are you need tests to tell you when the risk is getting close. You need an early warning system. And, and so every time we have uh, a new model, we test it for its capability to do these CBRN tasks, as well as testing it for, you know, how capable it is of doing tasks autonomously on its own. And uh, in the latest version of our RSP, which we released in the last in the last month or two, uh, the way we test autonomy risks is the model, the, the AI model's ability to do aspects of AI research itself. Uh, which, when the model, when the AI models can do AI research, they become kind of truly, truly autonomous. Uh, and that you know that threshold is important for a bunch of other ways. And and so, what do we then do with these tasks? The RSP basically develops what we've called an if-then structure, which is if the models pass a certain capability, then we impose a certain set of safety and security requirements on them. So today's models are what's called ASL2. Models that were a ASL1 is for systems that manifestly don't pose any risk of autonomy or misuse. So for example, a chess playing bot, Deep Blue, would be ASL1. It's just manifestly the case that you can't use Deep Blue for anything other than chess. It was just designed for chess. No one's going to use it to like, you know, to conduct a masterful cyber attack or to, you know, run wild and take over the world. ASL2 is today's AI systems where we've measured them and we think these systems are simply not smart enough to uh to you know autonomously self-replicate or conduct a bunch of tasks uh and also not smart enough to provide meaningful information about CBRN risks and how to build CBRN weapons above and beyond what can be known from looking at Google. Uh in fact, sometimes they do provide information, but but not above and beyond a search engine, but not in a way that can be stitched together. Um, not not in a way that kind of end to end is dangerous enough. So ASL three is going to be the point at which uh, the models are helpful enough to enhance the capabilities of non state actors. Right, state actors can already do a lot a lot of unfortunately to a high level of proficiency a lot of these very dangerous and destructive things the difference is that non state non state actors are not capable of it and so when we get to ASL3 we'll take special security precautions designed to be sufficient to prevent theft of the model by non state actors and misuse of the model as it's deployed uh we'll have to have enhanced filters targeted at these particular areas. Cyber, bio, nuclear. Cyber, bio, nuclear, and model autonomy, which is less a misuse risk and more risk of the model doing bad things itself. ASL4, getting to the point where these models could, could enhance the capability of a, of, a, of a already knowledgeable state actor and or become the, you know, the main source of such a risk. Like if you wanted to engage in such a risk, the main way you would do it is through a model. And then I think ASL4 on the autonomy side, it's it's some 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 amount of acceleration in AI research capabilities with an with an AI model. And then ASL5 is where we would get to the models that are, you know, that are that are kind of that are kind of, you know, truly capable, that it could exceed humanity in their ability to do to do any of these tasks. And so the 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 point of the if then structure commitment is is basically to say look I, I don't know i've been i've been working with these models for many years and i've been worried about risk for many years it's actually kind of dangerous to cry wolf it's actually kind of dangerous to say this that you know this this model is this model is risky and you know pe people look at it and they say this is manifestly not dangerous again it's 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 the the delicacy of the risk isn't here today, but it's coming at us fast. How do you deal with that? It's it's really vexing to a risk planner to deal with it. And so this if-then structure basically says, look, we don't want to antagonize a bunch of people. We don't want to harm our own, you know, our, our, our kind of own ability to have a place in the conversation by imposing these, these 
very onerous burdens on models that are not dangerous today. So the if then, the trigger commitment is basically a way to deal with this. It says you clamp down hard when you can show that the model is dangerous. And of course, what has to come with that is, you know, enough of a buffer threshold that you, that you know you can you can uh you, you know you're 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 not at high risk of kind of missing the danger. It's not a perfect framework. We've had to change it every every uh you know we came out with a new one just a few weeks ago and probably probably going forward we might release new ones multiple times a year because it's it's hard to get these policies right like technically organizationally from a research perspective but that is the proposal if then commitments and triggers in order to minimize burdens and false alarms now but really react appropriately when the dangers are here what do you think the timeline for ASL3 is where several of the triggers are fired and what do you think the timeline is for ASL4 yeah so that is hotly debated within the company um uh we are working actively to prepare ASL3 uh security uh security measures as well as ASL3 deployment measures um, I'm not going to go into detail, but we've made we've made a lot of progress on both, and you know we're we're prepared to be, I think, ready quite soon. Uh, I would I would not be surprised I would not be surprised at all if we hit ASL three uh, next year. There was some concern that we we might even hit it uh, 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 this year. That's still that's still possible. That could still happen. It's like very hard to say, but like I would be very very surprised if it was like 2030. Uh, I think it's much sooner than that. So there's a protocols for detecting it, the if then, and then there's protocols for how to respond to it. Yes. How difficult is the second, the latter? The, yeah, I think for ASL3, it's primarily about security um, and, and about, you know, filters on the model relating to a very narrow set of areas when we deploy the model. Because at ASL3, the model isn't autonomous yet. Um, uh, and, and so you don't have to worry about, you know, kind of the model itself behaving in a bad way, even when it's deployed internally. So I think the ASL three measures are, are, I won't say straightforward. They're, 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 they're rigorous, but they're easier to reason about. I think once we get to ASL four, um, we start to have worries about the models being smart enough that they might sandbag tests. They might not tell the truth about tests. Um, we had some results came out about like sleeper agents, and there was a more recent paper about, you know, can can the models uh, uh, mislead attempts to, you know, sand sandbag their own abilities, right? Show them, you know, uh, 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 present themselves as being less capable than they are. And so I think with ASL4, there's going to be an important component of using other things than just interacting with the models. For example, interpretability or hidden chains of thought. Uh, where you have to look inside the model and verify via some other mechanism that that is not you know is not as easily corrupted as what the model says uh, that that you know that 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 the model indeed has some property. Uh, so we're still working on ASL four. One of the properties of the RSP is that we we don't specify ASL four until we've hit ASL three, yeah. be and and I think that's proven to be a wise decision because even with ASL three. It again, it's hard to know this stuff in detail, and and it, it it we want to take as much time as we can possibly take to get these things right. So for ASL three, the bad actor will be the humans. Each humans, year. yes. And so there, it's a little bit more. Um, for ASL four, it's both. I think it's both. both. And so deception, and that's where mechanistic interpretability comes into play, and uh, hopefully the techniques used for that are not made accessible to the model. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, you can hook up the mechanistic interpretability to the model itself, um, but then you've then you then you then you've kind of lost it as a reliable indicator of uh, of, uh, of 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 the model state. There are a bunch of exotic ways you can think of that it might also not be reliable. Like if the you know model gets smart enough that it can like you know jump computers and like read the code where you're like looking at its internal state. We've thought about some of those. I think they're exotic enough. There are ways to render them unlikely, but yeah, generally. You want to you want to preserve mechanistic interpretability as a kind of verification set or test set that's separate from the training process of the model. See, I think uh, as these models become better and better, conversation and become smarter, social engineer becomes a threat too because they, they oh yeah they can start being very convincing to the engineers inside companies. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's actually like you know we've we've seen lots of examples of demagoguery in our life from humans, and and you know there's a concern that models could do that could do that as well.